Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Tom Green, who's come across to us from NASA Ames, uh, uh, where he is uh, in the Space Science Division and uh, astro uh, the Astrophysics branch of the Space Science Division. Tom did a BA in Physics uh, at UC Santa Cruz and then did a PhD in Astronomy at University of Arizona uh, before he came across to Ames. Uh, his career interests have focused on young stars and uh, young stellar populations, extrasolar planets. He currently runs the Bay Area Exoplanet Science Meetings here at the SETI Institute, and he's the director of the Ames Center for Exoplanet Studies. He also, as we'll find out uh, in today's talk, is interested in space telescopes and instrumentation. And uh, he's published extensively on uh, near-infrared spectroscopy of uh, young stellar objects and brown dwarfs, uh, protostars uh, and, their, and their photospheres as well. Uh, today he's going to talk to us about uh, Exoplanet and other applications of the WFIRST mission. So please join me in welcoming Tom. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you everybody for coming. Always uh, happy to hear, to talk about uh, what's going on with uh, future missions that will actually uh, happen, or likely to happen. WFIRST is certainly in that category. It, uh, you may have heard some about it. I'll, I'll give uh, history in the next slide, but uh, it's been changed recently. And uh, it's always been a mission focused on dark energy and uh, also microlensing for finding planets, very complementary to Kepler, which I'll try to show. And uh, this aspect about uh, coronography is new. There's a new instrument uh, for uh, uh, exoplanet coronography, and uh, also it has a much larger guest observer program. So larger than what? Uh, a lot of you probably haven't ever heard of this thing. So uh, we didn't either when I was on the decadal uh, committee that every 10 years uh, a bunch of people get together and decide what's best for astronomy and astrophysics. It's uh, both ground and space, and I was on the panel that looked at space missions. And uh, we saw a, uh, a number of proposals come in that uh, looked quite compelling. There are people that wanted to use a uh, moderate size space telescope for a number of different things. Uh, several different uh, dark energy measurements. I'll get into these different ones. I hear you're, you're going to have a talk on uh, these baryon acoustic oscillations uh, later this month here. Also, uh, weak lensing, a supernovae. Supernova were what won the uh, Nobel Prize, I think, in 2011 with uh, dark energy. Then uh, exoplanet microlensing, uh, a new way of, uh, uh, there have been some detections with uh, microlensing on Earth. Space could really open this up, similarly to what Kepler did for uh, transit detections. And uh, also a, uh, a wide field telescope would be great for a lot of surveys in the Milky Way, other galaxies. Then um, we thought that uh, this could be pretty modest, like a one and a half meter telescope, so about five feet in diameter and uh, much smaller than like the James Webb we're building now, smaller than the Hubble Space Telescope, but have a lot of pixels in, uh, over a very wide field, uh, a, a couple tenths of a square degree. I'll show you how big that is in a bit. Then uh, wanted to work in the near infrared, throw it out uh, where there, uh, it's a very popular spot these days, not in Earth orbit, but orbiting this point in the uh, Earth-Sun system called L2. It's about uh, three or four times further than the moon. It's a, it's a million miles away from here. I uh, have a five-year mission. And the idea was is uh, it should be affordable, where uh, we have some of the funds uh, that would be hopefully left over after uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is winding down. And uh, the whole thing would be maybe $2 million, excuse me, $2 billion in cost. Well, a few things happened since then. Before we even issued our report, or about the time we issued our report, we uh, got news that uh, uh, the James Webb wasn't in good shape programmatically. It uh, needed more money, and its launch is going to be delayed, which would delay any future observatory like this, like uh, WFIRST. So uh, a few science definition teams were formed uh, to figure out what to do. The first one uh, formed to study uh, what to do with the original uh, WFIRST, and then another one looked into a cheaper and smaller version see what could be done, uh, scope down, if it could still capture much of the science. And so everybody's kind of like mulling over, you know, we're sort of like pretty glum about uh, this. And then you may have heard, in the summer of 2012, NASA was given some leftovers from another agency uh, that just happened to be building 
uh, 2.4 meter space telescopes, the same size as the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, no coincidence, the Hubble Space Telescope came sort of from the uh, spy program. Uh, um, the National Reconnaissance Office builds and operates these. That uh, uh, We know that now. We didn't know that at the time Hubble was launched. It was, its existence was declassified in 1993. So uh, we got two telescopes. And then uh, a new uh, science team was put together to study whether these things are going to be useful for this WFIRST mission. And, uh, we put together a report and we found that, yeah, it turns out you give us a bigger telescope, we can do more science with it. And uh, the administrator of NASA got pretty excited about it and uh, he approved using these telescopes for this purpose. Uh, by the way, when they were given to NASA, they were uh, given to us for use in space science, but not looking down. We're not. <laughs> we're <laughs> so uh, works works for this application just fine. Okay. And then, um, one part of this new formulation of it is that a uh, new instrument was added uh, uh, to have a coronagraph to be able to blot out the light of nearby stars to look for planets nearby. And uh, so we've been studying that too. And uh, it's not the ideal telescope for that, but we can uh, do some pretty interesting stuff. Then, uh, so after we got approved to use this telescope, we went into a pretty uh, mad, uh, technical program uh, led by JPL where they uh, defined the particular coronagraph technology. There are about six competing technologies and we did a lot of uh, studies and simulations to figure out which ones would actually have a reasonable chance of working well with this telescope and narrowed it down to two or three depending on how you look at it. And then uh, also reviewed recently by uh, the National Research Council, they had a committee to see whether this new thing uh, is, uh, stays true to what the decadal survey uh, wanted the mission to do, and we got a, uh, 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 an endorsement from them, but also a warning saying keep the cost within the box. So what does this new telescope look like? Well, I think I've only seen one real picture of it, and then that was restricted to U.S. persons, because this, I guess because of its uh, 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 genealogy, it's a, uh, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a controlled item. But uh, this was a uh, picture of it from uh, Nature magazine, sort of showing how these things work. So it's a, uh, uh, this, mi this mirror here is 2.4 meters, like about 100 inches, the same size as the Hubble, and uh, came with this uh, uh, baffle we'll probably not use, but uh, we will use this, the secondary supports and the secondary mirror there, and we'll put some other stuff on the back of it. The uh, question is, uh, why is the baffle there? And uh, I assume something like that, but there's also got to be like a scan mirror to point down at the Earth. We'll, uh, we have different baffling because uh, uh, it's going to be at a different orbit. These are sort of the cartoon versions of a few of the different versions of this observatory. Uh, this uh, first one was the one, DRM-1, is sort of uh, DRM stands for Design Reference Mission. Uh, put together to pretty much follow what we had recommended in the decadal survey. They, they made the telescope a little smaller because they uh, didn't have a hole in the middle, so they're, they're able to get better images. And uh, uh, then once we found out how uh, the James Webb was going to be late and cost more, we tried to do something cheaper, so we made the telescope smaller still. And then uh, had more pixels in the detectors, but uh, actually fewer detectors by uh, making the pixels smaller. Then now, this is what we have, a 2.4 meter telescope and a lot of pixels. We have uh, 18 detectors and the wide field camera. Each one is uh, uh, 4,000 by 4,000 pixels. So you end up with uh, 300 million pixels. That's a big camera. There's uh, a little uh, integral field spectrograph for supernovae. And we've got the chronograph instrument and looking at a six year mission. So it has gotten bigger. This is uh, what uh, the science definition team is doing. We do have a report on this uh, first uh, look at this 2.4 meter. It's on the web on, uh, on this uh, NASA Goddard site here. And uh, we're working on a second one. We have an interim report this month and a final one in uh, January, two, uh, January of next year. We're really looking at a lot more details. There's uh, more work being done on the project. We've refined the coronagraph technology. We're uh, getting much more specific about what science this thing is likely to do. So we think it's going to do great science. That's what uh, uh, kind of science it's going to do. The, and I'll get into a little bit. It's going to stay true to the decadal surveys 
charge to uh, uh, figure out what is dark energy, in three, and it has three different uh, programs for that. Uh, the demographics of planets, uh, Kepler has shown that most planets that it's seen are nothing like what we have in the solar system. You know, it's like there's this huge population of planets between the size of Earth and Neptune uh, that Kepler has found that we just don't have here. So, I mean, uh, let's see what else is out there. And uh, also studying uh, really nearby planets uh, and what their uh, planetary systems are like, what their disks are like, and also uh, uh, galactic structure and evolution. So how is it going to do all this, you know? Uh, well, this wide field stuff is pretty interesting. You may have uh, heard, t you're going to hear talk about this really wide field camera called BOSS. So, and uh, Kepler was a pretty wide field uh, instrument. It was like 100 square degrees, and, uh, which is huge to stare at all the time. So if you look at more parts of space, you'll learn more things. This is an image of uh, the ultra deep field taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, about 10 days of uh, integration time put together there. That's about the field that the Hubble sees. And you can see uh, galaxies uh, uh, going uh, quite far back to uh, only like a few hundred million years after uh, the Big Bang. So uh, uh, to get statistics on these, you want to look at a lot. However, if it takes uh, 10 days for single pointing, you're not going to be able to look at many fields. So what if you had a field that was bigger than that? Like uh, maybe 200 times bigger. So that's what AFTA is going to do. It's going to deliver Hubble Space Telescope sensitivity and spatial resolution over a field that's over 200 times bigger. That's the, uh, uh, the increment that the wide field camera does. And this has pretty much been enabled by detector technology that uh, has been developed for the ground and also for the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, these are uh, near infrared one to two microns primarily. That was the question is what was the wavelength. So uh, this is just another picture. A lot of people don't like this one, but I kind of like it. Sort of shows the field of view. These are uh, the, the focal plane. It's been changed a little bit to be a little more curved to take advantage of the best image quality. This is the size of the moon. So if you saw the uh, lunar eclipse last night, the, uh, uh, it, it'd only take maybe a couple fields to get the whole full moon. And then these are the size, this is the size of the uh, equivalent camera on the Hubble. And this is the size of the equivalent camera on James Webb. No, no, uh, this has grisms and it has prisms. I'll talk a little bit about the instrumentation in a bit. Um, this shows uh, complementarity of, um, with James Webb. James Webb is something that we're building now and uh, we're going to launch this in 2018. It's a huge telescope, six and a half meters in diameter, 25 square meters of area. It's going to see the very first objects, whoops, that uh, uh, the very first objects that lit up the universe after the Big Bang. And, but it's not going to see uh, a big field. Uh, we, don't, we didn't uh, have a lot of detectors at the time, and uh, we had to make this advance. So uh, uh, now what AFTA is going to see, though, is going to be a much bigger area of closer things. We will uh, probably find a bunch of stuff that's of interest to James Webb. They should be flying at the same time. So uh, it'll be able to uh, survey a much larger fraction of the sky, not as deep, not as far back towards the Big Bang, which is uh, over on this side, but uh, be able to see things down to about 10% of the age of the universe. So in addition to uh, having this really uh, big field instrument, that's uh, this 288 uh, millions of pixels, there's also uh, going to be a uh, grism, which uh, does spectroscopy. You'll be able to get a spectrum of every point in the field. And uh, a separate spectrograph, you can put individual on like supernovae to figure out uh, their velocities. Uh, this is the wavelength range over which uh, it'll work uh, from uh, very red, of just, just the reddest the eye can see, out to a few times that in wavelength. Then um, there's a coronagraph instrument here. It's a very different beast from the one above. It's, it looks at a very small area with very good spatial sampling, and we try to blot out the star. Uh, so we'll look at the very closest stars of the sun, things within you know, uh, 10 parsecs or 30-some light years, and we'll try to uh, blot the stars out, look for their planetary systems very nearby. And uh, we'll try to show some examples of what we think that will do. And this is uh, really undergoing some focused technology development now. Science. Uh, I kind of like this picture. It sort of sums up what uh, we think the big science pillars are. This, uh, this whole top rectangle is all the dark energy. Um, it's going to be uh, these three different uh, surveys 
we're going to try to get after this question is what is dark energy in different ways? Um, baryon acoustic oscillations were around probably right after the Big Bang, and uh, these are just sort of uh, compressions in matter and, uh, and, and that have uh, propagated from the Big Bang into clusters of galaxies today. It gives a size scale of the universe. We're going to look at how that uh, changes in time. Then uh, supernovae, again, is what won the Nobel Prize. So uh, by looking, they're all about the same brightness, or people think they are. So uh, by measuring the brightness, you know how far away they are, and then you measure the velocity of the spectrograph, and then you see how uh, the universe is, uh, is changing its expansion rate. And weak lensing probes uh, matter. So um, I uh, don't know if I've got a, another slide of that, but uh, uh, we see an example of strong lensing right here on the SETI sign. This is, uh, these, these galaxies are uh, in the background are, are being uh, magnified by some uh, mass in front of them. So it's very sensitive to both dark and uh, luminous matter. Then we'll be doing planetary microlensing. I'll give an example of that. This coronography that I told you about, in the middle is where the star is blotted out, and these are so we can see planets nearby. And uh, there are a lot of smart people that will want to use this thing for a lot of different programs just because of the field. I'll give a few examples. There, uh, the decadal survey came up with about 20 questions. Uh, I wonder if we did that intentionally. But uh, so it's like the game of 20 questions of science for this decade. This mission seems to address uh, 14 or 17 of them, depending on uh, uh, how optimistic you are and how you do the counting. So uh, we think that uh, this observatory uh, really will do the science that we uh, hope for in this uh, decade. Uh, getting into the dark energy science. So, you know, one of the things we've learned in uh, the last decade is that uh, the more, we, well, I guess one of the things we, we've known for a while is the more we know, the less we know, right? And we've just learned it in particular in this case with uh, this dark energy because now we don't, we, we know there's like 70% of the mass energy of the universe that we just don't understand at all. And uh, the, uh, so let's uh, see how we can uh, get at that. So there are going to be three surveys with uh, AFTA that will uh, uh, get at this issue. So this is this imaging survey. This is uh, going to look at about 2,000 square degrees, which is about 5% of the sky. So it's going to spend, uh, oh, something like uh, over a year uh, getting uh, this uh, survey and uh, 500 million galaxies. So if this is what's going to be looking for uh, perturbations and shapes of galaxies due to matter in front of it. So this will uh, uh, map out the distribution of matter in the universe. Uh, then supernovae, uh, same technique, again, that won the Nobel Prize, uh, being able to measure uh, the velocities and brightnesses of supernovae to look at how the universe is uh, expanding. Then. Uh, also, the spectroscopic survey uses these baryon uh, acoustic oscillations. This has a, a known size scale so that uh, uh, it's actually uh, sort of absolutely calibrated. These other ones are more, uh, this one's rel relatively calibrated. So these three tend to cross calibrate each other and reduce systematic errors. So hopefully we can uh, hone in then on uh, what the equation of state is of the dark energy. I'm not going to talk about that too much because I want to focus more on planets on this talk. And that's also one of the big changes for this mission. So uh, one of the big, other big focus areas, you know, in astronomy for the last 15, 20 years, the big things have been dark energy and planets. So uh, we still don't know a lot. Uh, Kepler has really helped us understand diversity of planetary systems. There's this whole new class of planets I mentioned that we didn't know about, that uh, we know is common. However, uh, Kepler only uh, probes planets pretty close to their stars, just by the technique that it uses. We also don't know much about um, uh, circumstellar disks around planets, things like it's in, in our own solar system. And we'll need to know more about those if we want to study and search for Earths in the future. Because if uh, the stars are, have a lot of dust around them, it could really uh, blot out and obscure any kind of imaging of Earths. So um, we've got a, uh, a survey, believe it or not, to do uh, for, this, uh, for the exoplanets and also some pointed observations as well. So for this microlensing survey, um, we want to spend uh, uh, six periods of two months each looking at uh, these different fields towards the center of the galaxy. And uh, 
uh, we think we'll be able to get about 3,000 uh, new planet discoveries, very similar to the number of uh, Kepler uh, uh, candidates. I will, uh, I think I've got another slide that shows the uh, complementarity. And then, so this will be the statistical side. It'll be uh, sensitive to low mass planets and planets far from their stars. Those are two things that are orthogonal to Kepler. So it should uh, uh, be much more of a less bias uh, survey when you put them together. And then for the high contrast imaging, whoops, um, we want to look at individual uh, stars very nearby again. You've probably seen this picture, HR 8799. This is a ground-based image. The star is blotted out here, and you start to see the planets around there. So uh, the goal, too, is to take a step towards imaging Earths. And we'll need it uh, scientifically and technologically, because we just haven't flown this kind of hardware before uh, that can do this sort of active wavefront control. And uh, also, we haven't gotten any reflected light spectra of any planets besides those in our solar system. So uh, we will uh, learn from both of those. The, uh, Microlensing survey is the one that's going to be uh, complementary to Kepler. It's going to net uh, hopefully about 3,000 planets. And the way microlensing works is that uh, this is a ground-based image. You can see why we want a space image, because it'll be uh, much sharper. So there's like a background star and uh, uh, somewhere here. And then the idea is, is that uh, if uh, a, a star between us and the background, so this is, back, this is the star in the background is like at the center of our galaxy, then a star between us and, the gal and this background star will, will move by it, causing uh, this background star to brighten because the gravity of the foreground star bends the more light in our way. And then that's sort of what you're seeing uh, down here. This is just a plot of time showing uh, how the uh, star uh, will brighten. And you see these little narrow blips. Those are due to planets around the star. And it's a wild technique, but I mean, it's already found about, what, 20 planets or so on the Earth. And we expect to find thousands if we can do this in space, because we'll have much better spatial resolution, we'll have more depth, we'll be able to look continuously, and it'll be the same kind of revolution uh, that uh, Kepler brought to uh, transiting planets. And then this is uh, a, a plot sort of showing the sample space. So Kepler uh, sampled things pretty well out to about uh, the distance between the sun and the Earth. And this is where uh, most of its uh, discoveries uh, uh, I guess uh, have been, this is an old plot, so it doesn't look like it's actual, actual Kepler discoveries. And then uh, W first is in blue here, and then it'll be sensitive to planets further away from their stars, because they need to be separated enough, so in that uh, plot I showed you earlier, so you can tell the difference between the brightening of a background star by uh, the star and by the planet. So Tom, what are the ones in blue? Sorry. These are uh, expected discoveries from W first. Yes. Yeah, I've uh, gotten to a point where uh, it's a very dangerous step for scientists to spend more time simulating data than actually getting data. <laughs> so uh, beware of, of simulation. So this sort of shows also graphically the, uh, it's a little unfair to Kepler, it really should be done in a log way, but uh, uh, where the Kepler search area is projected onto our solar system. We, uh, Kepler is most sensitive to planets inside the Earth's orbit. And uh, so that's what we have here. And then, however, uh, W first is going to be most sensitive to planets outside of the Earth's orbit. So it'll be, it'll be sensing a much bigger area of the solar system with uh, Kepler down here and W first out here. It's a, maybe similar uh, 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 amounts of area in logarithmic space. So the idea is the two together should be greater than either one and really give us a good idea about planets. So in addition to knowing about them statistically, we want to know what we have nearby. You know, where can we find oil or, uh, or whatever? <laughs> you know, where, where, something I thought that might uh, yeah, res resonate uh, with uh, SETI is uh, yeah, searching where, 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 what, what are the, what's going on in the Havel zones and nearby stars, and we should be able to get pretty close to that. The way these coronagraphs work, this is... Uh, uh, concept of the, the aft emission. The star is blotted out, then there's an area that's controlled here uh, that's uh, pretty small, it's like uh, an arc second or so in size, and uh, then uh, we should be able to find a, uh, an exoplanet here that's only like one one billionth as bright as the star. 
and we have instruments that will take spectra. We should be able to differentiate between uh, planets similar to Jupiter and similar to Neptune based on their uh, compositions and, uh, and temperatures. And there's a little bit about the uh, technology for the chronographs here. So um, in addition to finding planets, we're also going to uh, measure this dust level around, uh, around stars and mature these technologies for uh, future uh, imaging. This sort of shows where we are technically and where we need to be with uh, this uh, uh, contrast thing. Hubble Space Telescope gives us contrast of about uh, one part in 10 to the four, so we can see something that's about 10,000 times dimmer than a nearby star. At, uh, so that's uh, the y-axis is the contrast, the x-axis is the separation, so a couple tenths, a few tenths of an arc second away, you could see something uh, 10,000 times dimmer than the star. However, uh, something like Jupiter down here, you know, if you move our solar system away from us, you'd see it's about a billionth uh, as bright as the sun. So, you know, we need to do a lot better than that. And Earth is 10 times harder still. So, uh, we need to follow this technology, and W first will get us almost all the way there to an Earth. We should be able to get to, uh, to Jupiter's. And it really is... Uh, uh, taking, uh, applying some uh, advanced technology in space for the first time. This is more simulated data showing what we may expect to see around nearby stars. So uh, if you look at uh, stars within 100 light years or 30 parsecs, these are uh, the, an estimated uh, planet simulation using the uh, Kepler statistics for how common planets are around stars, about two planets per star. And uh, these are the sorts of planets that may exist there. Giant planets are the ones we're probably uh, most sensitive to because uh, things get easier in the top right because then they uh, uh, get less, uh, uh, they, they get uh, brighter and further away from their stars. So 10 to the minus eight means that something is uh, 10 one billionths the brightness of its star. And 10 to the minus nine is uh, one, one billionth of its star. So we should be able to get some reasonable yield. The crosses there are known planets. Those are uh, known planets from Doppler radial velocity measurements from like uh, uh, Jeff Marcy and others have been making for a couple decades now. We uh, went to look and see how many of those known planets we could uh, detect and characterize. And it turns out that uh, we've done this for a few of the different coronagraph technologies we've been studying. And it looks like there are uh, about a dozen known Jupiters that can be uh, detected in uh, uh, each a little over uh, a day or two of time or less. And then uh, since we don't know about uh, much lower mass ones, these sort of show uh, uh, potential lower mass ones given uh, Kepler's planet population statistics. There may, if you just look at the same stars, there may be other planets there as well. So we do have some good targets. It's good that we know their masses because uh, you can really understand what their spectra are telling you much better if you know their masses to understand their atmospheres. Um, this is just a blow up of a curve I showed before that sort of showed the quality of spectra we expect to uh, get. So uh, resolution about 70 is uh, good enough to resolve these different bands of methane here. So those are the, the major features. And uh, be able to tell the difference uh, uh, if, if the two planets are the same distance from their star, you see that uh, this uh, Neptune spectrum is much deeper because it's got a uh, higher concentration of heavy elements. So there is uh, uh, more methane, more water in the atmosphere than compared to Jupiter. And by knowing these compositions relative to their star, we get an idea of how they may have formed. The technique that you use scientifically is actually very well developed because this is what people use in our solar system. This is just reflected light from planets. You know, uh, we've been uh, studying reflected light from planets through telescopes for 400 years, right, since uh, Galileo looked at Jupiter, right, 1609. And uh, uh, it really uh, evolved into a uh, science of spectroscopy in the 1960s. Uh, what uh, happens is, is that light comes in from uh, the nearby star, hits the, goes into the planet's atmosphere, hits a cloud, cloud reflects it back out to us, to the Earth. And then by uh, looking at how much absorption there is at different wavelengths, then we can kind of figure out uh, what's here and, and uh, how high those clouds are. So uh, there's uh, a good bit of information that uh, you can get from these spectra, and uh, a lot of the details have been worked out. We kind of know what, uh, what the limits are, what we might get. 
this sort of shows uh, the differences of the giant planet spectra in our own solar system that uh, hopefully we could uh, observe. So Jupiter and Saturn look pretty uh, similar here. However, uh, Saturn is a little deeper in, uh, in, in its uh, methane here, again, because it's uh, got a uh, higher concentration of metals, of uh, heavy elements. And then this is, uh, and then the clouds are lower because they're colder in Uranus and in Neptune. In addition to planets, we know that uh, there are disks around nearby stars. This is disk planetary debris from things crashing into each other, okay? And uh, so the ones that are really bright have a lot of activity, so they must have planets. And indeed, a number of these systems have uh, found to have planets, like um, uh, Fomalhaut and uh, uh, Beta Pic have, uh, uh, I guess there's thought, thought to be planets there, and some of these other, one, other uh, systems as well. Uh, 8799 is another one that's not on here. So, however, we've only really been able to look at the very brightest ones with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope at the ground. Uh, this unit here is uh, 1,000 zodi, means 1,000 times our own zodiacal cloud, uh, so our, the level of dust in our solar system. We hope to do much better than that. We also will be able to image pretty close in to their stars. This shows uh, the mask that's uh, masked out, and this uh, Hubble image of a uh, nearby uh, star. This is uh, a, a sun-like star that's uh, about 100 light years away. And uh, however, we can't see in to uh, this inner region here. However, um, uh, with this Hubble instrument, then it's, it has almost a two arc second uh, uh, inner working angle. However, um, uh, W-first is going to have a uh, much smaller inner working angle, just the size of that red dot. This is, uh, beware more simulated data here. This is uh, using the uh, uh, simulations of the coronagraphs uh, with the wavefront error of this telescope and putting in different kinds of disks. This disk here is about 20 times the level of our sun. Uh, you can see the detections there, that's black there, black, some airy rings left over from uh, uh, the telescope, and it's, it's inclined at an angle this way, so we can definitely detect things, instead of being 1,000 or 10,000 zodis, we can image them at uh, 10 zodis is uh, going to be our limit, so 10 times the level of our solar system. Should be a, uh, a big jump there. Also, the distribution of material uh, tells where planets are, if anything is being uh, shepherded around. The stuff out here is all like uh, leftover artifacts uh, from the uh, coronagraph and uh, wavefront control. So, um, the, uh, again, the major questions of the debris is uh, how much dust is there? Where is it? Uh, that gives an idea of how much planetary activity. The other question is uh, um, what are the sizes and compositions of the grains? We should uh, have a polarimeter on here so we can actually look at uh, different polarizations coming off the grains in reflected light, which should hopefully help us separate dust from planets because you can imagine a dust clump might uh, look a lot like a planet, have, uh, particularly if they're in similar orbits. Uh, another thing this does is it helps us just figure out how dusty our uh, neighbors are so, uh, and how this could interfere with uh, imaging for Earths because even though dust isn't very uh, bright on a per, uh, per given area, but if you uh, look within a uh, resolution element, a lot of light could be there, and it could be actually more than an Earth for a, uh, a reasonable sized telescope. So, uh, just like to, uh, I guess, maybe reiterate, reiterate a couple points I made on this first planet graph. Uh, we want to go five orders of magnitude beyond Hubble in terms of how well we do this uh, contrast suppression. And uh, that's this big jump in contrast from uh, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the, 10 to the 9. So we can suppress uh, uh, the starlight by a billion times. And uh, by the technology we're using is a lot of the same technology that's been developed from the ground. It's been applied in space. The algorithms are pretty different because you have different kinds of disturbances. The atmosphere is, dominates on the ground. It's a very fast thing. In space, we have much lower disturbances. And, uh, but all these individual items uh, are needed in future Earth imaging missions. So uh, it should be very useful to uh, advance the technology. This, these coronagraphs, uh, pointing control, that's what this low order stuff is, uh, deformal mirrors, speckle suppression detectors. Uh, 
No, no, there's a, there's a, there's a performance. The question is, what is extreme AO? Uh, yeah, we can maybe handle that in the questions uh, at the end. Uh, okay, so in addition to uh, doing this dark energy and doing uh, planets, there are a lot of smart people. Uh, this, when you have a telescope that's capable with uh, an imager like this, there's going to be a lot of other science people want to do. We actually solicited white papers from the community uh, last year, and we got uh, over 50 responses for some great ideas. Uh, try to illustrate a few of these. And there's just uh, a lot of discovery to, uh, from near to far, from looking for uh, the closest stars, M dwarfs, and brown dwarf stars, out to uh, the most distant galaxies in the universe. This is a, a little bit of a uh, comparison of different uh, current and recent, somewhat recent observatories. So uh, from the uh, WISE Explorer at uh, uh, 0.4 meters uh, up to uh, Hubble at 2.4 and now AFTA. So you see we've got about the same spatial resolution in this column as a Hubble Space Telescope, maybe a little bit bigger, but again, this much bigger field of view and uh, the similar uh, wavelength coverage. Then uh, Spitzer is still flying. It goes to uh, longer wavelengths, but uh, it has nowhere near this kind of field of view or the, uh, just the light gathering power. Uh, this is gonna be tremendous for doing imaging in the Milky Way. This is a uh, star formation region in uh, the Milky Way. Uh, right now, the, uh, uh, the only really wide field surveys we have have been done from the ground because we just haven't had the time and an instrument in space that could, uh, with a big enough field, that could do everything. You know that uh, Larry here was uh, instrumental in two mass, and this should be something like uh, uh, a thousand times deeper than this uh, two mass survey here. And this again shows the uh, W-first field and what uh, Hubble sees in there and what James Webb sees in there. So be able to do uh, uh, some great surveys. This is an example of our uh, nearest uh, grand spiral neighbor galaxy, uh, Andromeda galaxy, and uh, M31. This is a region of about uh, over a third of the galaxy uh, that's uh, being surveyed now with uh, uh, the Hubble. That's a, a close-up of it. You can get multiple spiral arms in there, understand about populations of stars in here, and uh, you need to look at a big region to understand gradients in uh, compositions as you go out, uh, and uh, also any kind of changes in ages. And so, this is what some poor people are doing on the Hubble. 432 fields, okay, to, uh, to do this. But uh, if you had W first, it's two fields, okay, <laughs> with some overlap. So, uh, you know, it, it really enables science on a different scale. This, you really enter the statistical realm when you've got a uh, field like this. Now, uh, the ground's been doing this for a while. The Sloan Telescope was probably the first one that did this. The LSST is coming online. And uh, this sort of shows that we're gonna be very complementary to this LSST. This is a six and a half meter telescope. It's, going, it's uh, being built now. It'll uh, be located in Chile. And it only really works out into the visible. You see its sensitivity, uh, this is the y-axis, falls off a lot down here. But uh, we pick up in the, uh, once you get to uh, a micron. So it'll be very similar sensitivities uh, to what the LSST is going to see, so be able to actually look at some of the same objects at, over this really broad wavelength range. Europeans are building another uh, mission for dark energy. It's not going to be as capable. It's a smaller telescope, it's Euclid, and uh, you see in the infrared, it's uh, really not going to have the same kind of uh, capabilities. The orders of magnitude, uh, an order of magnitude less sensitive. So it could be uh, 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 a factor of 100 different in time. All right, just a uh, few words on what's going on with the project status. This is uh, a rendering of what the uh, observatory would look like. It's based on a solar dynamics observatory bus, which is a uh, similar size telescope, uh, also in uh, geostationary, no, geosynchronous orbit, not geostationary orbit, which is where this is going to be. Uh, 2.4 meter uh, mirror, We've got this uh, wide field instrument, 18 detectors that I've been uh, blathering about. We'll have the chronograph and uh, supernova spectrograph. It's gonna be heavy, uh, over uh, six tons. This is about the weight of the James Webb Space Telescope. 
And uh, a lot of this you see is, uh, is going to be fuel, because you look at the difference in propellant. You look at uh, two, uh, uh, two and a half tons of propellant. This will allow it to uh, maybe move around in its orbit. And one of the goals is to have this thing robotically serviced. So uh, actually it's sort of a, a constraint for us. Uh, people think that there's gonna be a market for doing servicing of uh, the spacecraft in geosynchronous orbit. There are a lot of dead communication satellites there only because they've run out of fuel. And uh, there are people right now uh, that are you know, working on these kinds of things and uh, uh, we've got a standard interface bus that uh, they may be able to swap instruments out. Are you talking robotic? Robotic servicing, yes. No, no, this is geosynchronous orbit. So, uh, but we may need to get to geostationary depending on where the um, uh, robotic servicing is. That's why it has a lot of fuel there. Uh, anything else? Uh, compatible with Atlas V or Falcon 9 Heavy. It's probably uh, a little big for uh, a regular Falcon 9. Hopefully those will become available. I could help keep the uh, cost down. This uh, shows the, uh, we're gonna keep the, the same uh, basic telescope structure. Unfortunately, it has these six struts that are rather large, and that's what's really uh, hindering performance the most for this planet imaging. It's uh, uh, just diffracting a lot of light uh, out. But uh, as you saw, the chronograph should be able to uh, still uh, image large planets around nearby stars. Let's see if there's anything useful down there. Oh yeah, so the telescope is about uh, 1,600 kilograms, so 1 1.6 tons of the six tons total. So it's uh, quite the, the most substantial element there. Uh, just a schematic, the telescope right now is a two mirror, two mirror telescope. Uh, however, what we're gonna do is add a third mirror. And we're gonna resurface this first mirror, that 2.4 meter. And it turns, the, it turns it into a three mirror telescope. And that's how you get the huge field. You know, something like uh, the Hubble optics alone isn't going to give you a huge field, but if you turn it in, to, you make a three mirror and a stigmat, and you get a, uh, a big field of view, which enables it to use this uh, big focal plane of detectors that we saw. And then there's a, uh, uh, have different filters that could, that could uh, uh, image here. There's also a uh, grism here that will uh, actually give a spectrum of every field point on here, and that's going to be used in this at Baryon Acoustical Oscillation Survey. A separate little spectrograph just to uh, look at individual supernovae. And then the coronagraph has got all the GWIS parts here from uh, ground-based adaptive optics. There's uh, formal mirrors. There's a low-order wavefront sensor that looks for things like on the order of, uh, you know, uh, uh, 100 times a second or, and, uh, and slower. And uh, then we'll uh, uh, stabilize the wavefront with these formal mirrors and then there's also, there's a camera. We'll be able to take the pictures and a spectrograph which uh, give the sort of spectra that I was trying to show for what the planets may look mm -hmm. like. This hardware exists for the chronograph. This is uh, the telescope here and sort of shows the light coming into the chronographic instrument and uh, goes through a, a bunch of full mirrors and the steering mirror here that uh, uh, takes uh, corrects any kind of fast steering that uh, the any jitter the telescope has. Then these are the deformable mirrors that uh, uh, the telescope has remapped onto them and they kind of touch up any kind of opt optical uh, problems across the surface. And uh, then the uh, coronagraph guts themselves are, uh, are here and that's what uh, suppresses the star. And then we get uh, uh, imaging onto uh, the camera here or, in, uh, or, or spectra into this camera. So good news, all this stuff exists. We just need to make a system and fly it in space. Easy. <laughs> so um, just a uh, wrap up here as to uh, what's coming next. So uh, we were lucky this year. Um, the Senate wrote in uh, $54 million for this. This is a lot of money for a project that hasn't even started yet. And so we're using it to reduce risk. Uh, a lot of this is going into developing these near-infrared detectors. The, uh, the ones we need don't exist yet. What we want to do is take the ones like are on James Webb but make them smaller. So that's uh, really uh, where this development is going. Uh, a lot's going into this coronagraph, a lot of work being done at JPL along with funding some of the people that uh, uh, came up with the coronagraph designs. 
also some science studies. And uh, like, uh, like, for example, I'm doing disk simulations, other people are doing dark energy simulations, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, design work trying to figure out how cold can we take this telescope, can we operate it at longer wavelengths into the infrared, and, uh, so, and also flowing down, capturing requirements and flowing them down now, really want to reduce risk so that when we do get the okay to start, hopefully around uh, 2017 or so, then we uh, can just have a plan all mapped out. Trying to engage the community, um, and have uh, talks, I have this talk here. They've been having sessions at the American Astronomical Society meetings. We're going to actually have a cold planets meeting in the Boston meeting in uh, June. Then uh, there's gonna be a surveys meeting uh, this fall in Pasadena. So for probably the, the dark energy survey and uh, microlensing survey. We're gonna complete, uh, the science team is gonna complete its report in uh, next January. And then uh, the whole mission is gonna be costed again by uh, a third party, by the Aerospace Corporation. And then uh, there's gonna be a mid-decadal review as just uh, part of the whole decadal survey process in 2016, we're gonna present this and say, this is what we wanna do for w first, and then uh, hopefully we'll get a thumbs up. And uh, then uh, hopefully the uh, administration and Congress will see uh, it fitting to fund this so that uh, we can make it happen. And uh, maybe by uh, 2024, we'll be getting data. So uh, thank you very much. Um, Tom, uh, what, uh, uh, this is a little bit off topic, what, what else is competing for the, the 2.4 meter uh, uh, dark, so darkly source telescopes? How, uh, how many other plans are in the mix? Um, it has been decided by the NASA administrator that one of them is gonna be used for this mission. So there are no, there's no other competition on, for this one. Now two were given to NASA and there were some studies done, uh, solicited, for what would you do if you had a uh, 2.4 meter telescope in astrophysics and other fields as well. And uh, uh, I think NASA decided not to act on those. So I don't think they're even really categorized. The, um, uh, I think that in general, NASA goes by these decadal surveys for uh, big bucks. So if somebody were to show that you could address uh, different science in the, the, the kid will laid out with another one of these, then I think uh, NASA's ears would, would perk up. Okay, we had a question at the back. Hey Tom, interesting talk. Um, on the latter part of the Kepler mission, a lot of the work went into characterizing false positives and catalog completeness. And my understanding is with Microlensing, there's no follow-up or repeat event. So I'm wondering what your approach is to, to these issues when it comes time to publish your statistics. Yeah, I'm not a real expert on microlensing, but I would think that the images themselves and the distortions that you get are going to uh, probably identify it as really a lensing event and not like a flare or something like that. And uh, I just don't know enough about uh, the shape profiles as to what uh, are likely false positives and uh, what can be ruled out. Uh, now, you know, things like binaries are probably not that, wouldn't give a false positive, right, because we're sensitive to mass. And, uh, and so it'd be a different, different uh, false pos positives from Kepler. But uh, should probably, uh, actually we've been thinking about having a microlensing expert come and give a talk to uh, our Bay Area exoplanet meetings to uh, address questions like that. So just following up, uh, if you could just say a little bit more about what you meant by extreme adaptive optics, and then mm -hmm. a different question. Is there any value in that starshade concept flying out in front of this W first or, or not? Okay, um, extreme adaptive optics is a technique that's been, uh, it's being developed on the ground. The first instrument that probably really uh, uses extreme AO has just been deployed to the Gemini Observatory, which is uh, the GPI. Uh, uh, instrument, okay? And then, yeah, so people, definitely people uh, in this community have uh, been working on it. And uh, you know, that's where you're uh, really trying to uh, correct wavefronts, uh, you know, you're trying to correct faster than the atmosphere can do, and you're not just uh, uh, doing a, uh, 
I, I guess I don't technically know, I've forgotten the uh, distinctions between like regular AO, like on uh, uh, the Keck Observatory now, and uh, a lot of the, the, the GPI stuff, but it's when you dig a specific dark hole around an object and you're trying to correct over a limited radius as opposed to uh, just, uh, you know, removing seeing as best as possible. That's a, so sorry, that's a terrible explanation, but yeah, yeah. Oh, a star shade. Yeah, uh, yeah, a star shade would be really great. You know, it's like, it's, for people, it's, it's an alternative to the chronograph, uh, very different technology. What you do is you have two spacecraft, you fly uh, a thumb uh, 100,000 kilometers away from your telescope. You put your thumb over the star, and then you just kind of look next to it for the planet. <laughs> Great. I mean, because it really breaks the degeneracies. Because so with uh, the chronographs, it's like uh, always that angle that you have is proportional to the diameter of the telescope, and there's some other things in there. And you, you uh, break that degeneracy. The problem is, is that they just haven't been demonstrated. You know, it's like, and no one's going to, I think you're going to need a, a flight demonstration because the, the tolerances are just incredible that you need to do. Because you need to be able to fly these things are 100,000 uh, kilometers apart. You need to control them within, you know, meters left and right. The, the pedals of these things are 50 meters. They have to deploy to within, you know, a uh, tenth of a millimeter. There can't be little glints and all that sort of stuff. There, there are a lot of studies going on. But, I mean, if you get one of these things to work, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really the way to go. And then you can use any telescope. It doesn't have to be any kind of fancy uh, telescope. You don't need to have this kind of graph. The um, microlensing, over here, mm -hmm. the, the microlensing uh, survey sounds very similar to the LSST microlensing survey. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, weak lensing survey. Okay. Um, how is it complementary and how is it similar? Well, we're going to get... Uh, mm -hmm much deeper in redshift. So be able to sample a much uh, a bigger volume, I think. We'll be able to look for much, we have much finer spatial resolution. You know, uh, the native spatial resolution is like uh, 110 milli arc seconds here, and it's uh, seeing limited on LSST. So that's gonna be like half an arc second. So I think you'll be uh, sensitive to much smaller amounts of mass, you know, from distortions. Uh, I think Ken had your hand up for a while. Hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, well, the detectors need to be cooled or they're going to be in ambient uh, temperature? Uh, they need to be cooled, but it's going to be done passively with a radiator. So uh, probably on the order of uh, 110, 120 Kelvin, that sort of thing, which should be no problem. Actually, we have to heat the telescope a lot. So uh, and uh, it should be no problem to uh, keep the detectors cooled. Uh, a technical question about your coronagraph optics. Mm -hmm. I mean, given this uh, 10 to the minus 9th contrast mm -hmm. ratio and all of those mirrors that mm -hmm. I saw, and you mm -hmm. had, these days, what sort of surface figures do, does it take to get the suppression of scattering from that? And how does that compare to Hubble, for example? Just to yeah, well, the surface figure of these mirrors, eh, it's okay. I think, I think the wave front is about 50 nanometers RMS. And we're, we can live with that. But the thing is, is that the key thing is having uh, these deformal mirrors where we can touch up. So what you do is you image the pupil on these deformal mirrors, and then each one you're pistoning by very small amounts. So you're correcting these, these moderate spatial frequency wavefront errors. So I'm just, well, not wavefront error, but just the, uh, the rough surface roughness. Surface roughness? Oh, yeah, for scattered light. That's a good point. Uh, I uh, don't think there are any particularly tough specs on surface roughness. I, and I, yeah, I don't think that's uh, uh, a, a, a big requirement, the way the chronographs work. And I can hook you up with somebody in the audience and tell you about that afterwards. Yeah. Uh, Tom, uh, it looks like that large format uh, focal plane array is going to require possibly a stretch in data transmission uh, for NASA and also have you looked at the uh, data analysis uh, required for this thing? It looks huge. Uh, yeah, it's going to take a lot of data, but it's, uh, we have to get that in place for the LSST. I mean, the LSST is going to uh, observe its entire observable sky every three nights. You know, it's got more, there, this is not a big focal plane for astronomy. You know, and uh, Google is investing in LSST uh, algorithms and whatnot. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, 
Uh, that is a concern and need to keep an eye on it, but hopefully we're not going to be pushing the bleeding edge there. The uh, uh, comms available, uh, we don't need to go to laser comm or anything like that. And uh, there is commercial uh, stuff available that fits within the budget and fits on the, the, on the spacecraft and all that. The going to uh, geo-orbit really helps. I mean, I think people know how to you know, get your cable signals down very, very quickly and <laughs> don't take advantage of some of that technology. Okay, no, no further questions. Um, Tom, we have a, uh, a special SETI mug. Um, it's not a thumb, but maybe you can use it as a chronograph. Uh, <laughs> oh, great. Uh, to block out some light at uh, some stage in the early in the morning when you're working on W first. So uh, please join me in, in thanking Tom for his great talk. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you, SETI. I could probably actually accept this. This is probably, probably less than $25. And, and don't tell me if it's not. <laughs> great. Ha, ha, ha.